Hello everybody, my name is Banaf Shehori. I am here as laser trainer here in IMA Dubai. And the purpose of this webinar is for you to understand more of our courses and understand the quality of training we are giving here in IMA. Our laser course consists of five full days here. Um, we have participants that wish to participate the first two days. They will be granted with laser technician certificate, which with this certificate, they can do practice hair removals. And uh, participants who are attending the full five day course here in IMA, they will be granted with laser therapist certificates which they can do different procedures depending on their background, whether they are doctors or dermatologists or nurses, depending what DHA approves for us to do. So for today, I picked a topic that it's a very, very interesting and very important topic in lasers, which is called tissue effects. But of course, before going to tissue effects, tissue optics, and what happens when I hit my skin with any laser, I have to have the basic information about uh, laser physics, what is the characteristic of wavelength, what kind of wavelengths can I give to the skin. So these all comes in different lectures. Usually the first day of our course is a day of full of lectures. We talk about several concepts that we want all the participants to pay attention to our concepts. Uh, for every topic that we talk, we have the hands-on on the topic. This is just an example of one of the important topics of lasers. We know that. Uh, we will start talking about it a little bit. Of course, before this lecture, we talked already about the laser physics. We are supposed to know the characteristics of the light, the wavelength, uh, different wavelengths with different skin types, classifications of skin types. All of these we already finished with the lecture once we reach to this slide. We are finished with the basic information. Once we are here, we, uh, this uh, lecture tells us what happens to our skin when I hit my skin with any light or laser. The explanation is that, as you know, majority part of the laser gets absorbed by your target. I have means of controlling the other part of the light, which is the scattered part. With the scattering, we always say use a big spot size because the smaller spot sizes, they are much more prone to have scattering effect. Uh, when talking about scattering, we always talk about using a high flux in laser. Of course, you have to know what is the meaning of high flux. When we are talking about high flux in aesthetics, we mean that using a laser in high power over a shorter time. Using a laser with a low flux will put your patient in a risk of skin necrosis because you are increasing the scattered amount of light going to the skin. So, so far we talked about absorption and scattering. We have two other scenarios that might happen when I hit my skin with any laser. One is reflection. Fortunately, the reflection and transmission is neglectable part of the laser. You know that. Light skin reflects more, dark skin absorbs more. It's like wearing white in the summer, wearing black in the winter. So lighter the skin I have, I have more, uh, more reflection. That's one of the reasons explained to you why you don't have very good effect in hair removal in bony areas, on your knees, on your fingers, on your toes, why the result is not as good. Now you know it's because of the bone underneath, because the white bone reflects so much of the laser backwards. The very, very neglectable part of the laser sometimes transmits beyond where I want it to transmit, which now with explanation, you should know that I don't have any means to control reflection or transmission. I cannot change the patient's skin type and transmission is not in my hand. So basically, with the parameters of laser, I am adjusting and arranging the absorption and scattering amount. This is a very, very important slide. And basically what we do in aesthetic is all based on this slide. This, this slide tells you the absorption curve of our three chromophores. The first and basic chromophore, primary chromophore of our body is melanin. You know that we have melanin in our skin. 
They have melanin in our hair, we have melanin in our eyes. This is the pigment that we have, and it's considered as our basic chromosome. The explanation of this slide is the absorption curve of melanin, absorption curve of oxygenated hemoglobin, which is considered as our secondary chromophore, and the absorption curve of water. The term of chromophore comes from the Greek term of chrome by the meaning of color. And four is anything that likes to absorb color, we call it chromophore, as we discussed. Melanin is our primary chromophore. Our secondary chromophore is oxygenated hemoglobin. And our third chromophore, although it doesn't have color, but because it has absorption, is water. So, on this absorption curve slide, I will, I will see that melanin's absorption curve is a very easy, straightforward absorption. As you can see, in melanin, my absorption gets lower when I go in longer wavelengths. This means shorter the wavelength, higher the absorption. In which treatments melanin is my chromophore? Definitely in pigmentation treatments in treating pigmentation melanin is my chromophore and in hair removal melanin is my chromophore for hair removal you know that the first wavelength that we start treating the hair removal is 755 it's alexandrite so some of you might think that why do i wait until 755 for laser to start why don't i start with 400 because here the graph is showing me that 400 has much more absorption to 755. So why do I wait until 755 to start my hair removal or sometimes 694? So for every treatment, you have to consider two facts. One is the first is always the safety. Safety tells me, can I give a short wavelength to a dark skin type or not? This is safety. Second one is efficacy. For efficacy, I have to define what is my target and then where is my target located in the skin. You know that when we are talking about hair removal, we are talking about hair follicles. Majority of our hair follicles, they are in dermis, they are not in epidermis. When I have a shorter wavelength, according to our rule of electromagnetic spectrum, you know that shorter wavelengths they have higher frequencies but they penetrate very superficially they cannot penetrate deep down in the skin so i have to pick a wavelength that is able to reach to my hair follicle and then create a heat to where my target is that's why the first wavelength that we actually start for hair removal is 755 and then longer wavelength after 755 will be and diet with 810 or 800 nanometer and then the wavelength after for hair removal would be MDF with 1064 nanometer depending on the skin type I have to pick what is appropriate for my skin type safety tells me never give an alexandrite to skin type 5 that's why I know that if I pick a MDF my absorption is not as good as Alex but safety is my first rule I have to commit to safety before committing to efficacy. This is about hair removal. When my target is treating pigmentation, again, melanin is my absorption curve. We heard or you have seen or heard in aesthetics that we say green is the best color for treating superficial pigmentation. Then now with this graph, you will know why, because green is the first wavelength that can reach to my epidermal pigmentation. Epidermal, not dermal. The second question again would be, in which skin type can I give a green wavelength? Can I give it green to skin type five or even four? The answer is no. No matter how superficial is your pigmentation, you have to commit to safety first. So green, is best color for superficial pigmentation if you have a skin type one to three if your skin type is above three 
or your pigmentation is not a superficial epidermal pigmentation, is a bit of a dermal pigmentation, then you have no choice but to use a longer wavelength like MDR. This is when my melanin is not prominent. Sometimes in some scenarios like pelagiectasia, like cherry angioma, like rosacea, my chromophore is oxygenated hemoglobin. As you can see in this slide, oxygenated hemoglobin again has a very good peak in 400, which in practice is not practical because 400 doesn't penetrate in my skin. Even if I have a telangiectasia, it will be epidermal. It will be superficial telangiectasia, which I need to reach to it by a wavelength of the laser. So we say yellow is the best color for superficial red telangiectasia, red vascular lesions, because yellow is the first wavelength that can reach to my red vascular lesions are, and it is in the peak of absorption. As you can see, the absorption comes down afterwards. Red on red doesn't have absorption. It means I can never remove a red lesion with a red laser. I should always target anything I want with opposite color of the laser. And then it continues a bit until 1064. So if I have, again, my question would be in which skin type can I give a yellow laser, regardless of how superficial and red the vascular lesions are? The answer again would be skin type one, two, three. This means if I had a skin type four with a red vascular lesion, or my vascular lesion was a bit deeper, it was a bit bluer and deeper. Definitely, you know that I'm not talking about varicose vein. So if I had a deeper lesion or my skin type didn't allow me to use a yellow laser, then I have no choice again but to use an MDR. So as you can see, MDR here in my aesthetic clinics is not only used for hair removal. I can use it for my vascular lesion. I can use it for my pigmentation, depending on the MD. Like if I have a Q-switch laser, of course, it's preferred to use it for pigmentation rather than the long pulse uh, laser. My third chromophore is water. You know that water, although it doesn't have color, but it absorbs the laser. That's why for me, it's considered a chromophore. So water absorption, as you can see, um, before the number, we have a very important number in laser, which is 1,400. Water absorption before this number is neglected. I don't consider water absorbing anything before this number. Water absorption for me starts from 1,400. I want you to remember a point that the more water absorption I have, the more superficial I have a laser, it means. You know that we are contained in water, 70% of our body weight is water. So where do we have water? All the cells in our body, including our epidermal cells. So when I'm giving a laser that it's after the water absorption, after the range of water absorption, the best peak of absorption is at the range of erbium light, which is 2940. And then I have the second peak at CO2, which is 10,600. So when I have the peak of water absorption, whatever laser I give, it's absorbed by the first line of epidermal cell. The laser is used all in order to water absorption. When the laser is used and absorbed by water, the heat of the laser goes beyond even 70 degree goes above 100 degree and starts boiling and evaporating the water. By evaporating the water, it evaporates the cell and tissue that was within, the water was within. So that's how erbium yak resurfaces or ablates the skin by boiling the water. So I want you guys to remember, the more water absorption, the more superficial your laser goes. As you can see, this is just a schematic view to show you that longer the wavelength, deeper the penetration. And once you have the erbium yag and CO2 that they are after the range of absorption, actually they are the two peaks of water absorption, I want you to pay attention how superficial your laser is.
again, the same concept approximately, if with a blue laser purple blue laser, I have 50 microns penetration depth. With a green laser, I have less than one millimeter. With a yellow laser, I have approximately two millimeters. With 7.55, I have approximately three millimeters penetration depth. And with NDF, I have approximately four millimeters penetration depth. The mechanism that I work with, usually with long pulse lasers, as you know, it's heat. I work with the mechanism of heat. It means I give a laser, this laser, absorb this light, the light transferring to heat, and I want the heat to be to the extent of killing or lysing or cooking my target. This sure. mechanism is called photothermolysis. It means I gave a photo, which is my laser. This photo turned to thermal effect. This thermal was to the extent of lysing my target, and I have to be careful to do it selectively. That's why majority of the times, the mechanism of majority of what we do is a selective photothermolysis. Photoacoustic is the mechanism of Q-switch lasers. Q-switch lasers, they are fast lasers. The difference between a Q-switch and a normal laser, you know that for all the wavelengths, I have the Q-switch format. I have Ruby, I have Q-switch Ruby. I have Alex, I have Q-switch Alex. I have NTF, I have Q-switch NTF. The normal lasers that we I can do selective photothermolysis are refer are referred as LP long pulse lasers. So you will find LP Yad, LP Alex. This means it works with the mechanism of long pulse. Long pulse lasers, their pulse duration, pulse duration. It's the time it takes for the laser to come out of the handpiece. With long pulse lasers, your pulse durations are in milliseconds. With Q switch lasers, your pulse duration is in nanoseconds. So now that you have such a fast laser, remember that a Q switch laser doesn't have time to create this heat. There is no time to reach to 70 degrees and kill my target with heat. Photoacoustic lasers or Q switch lasers, they basically shiver, create Acoustic uh, mechanism is a mechanism I use for tattoo removal. I cannot heat up the tattoo. Tattoo is a color part. It absorbs my laser. It, it burns the skin, blister and burn, and ten, third degree burn. So over the tattoo, I have no choice but to use something that doesn't heat up the ink of the tattoo. I come and shiver and basically burst the tattoo ink with smaller particles until my body comes and photosites the tattoo, the small inks. What else am I using it nowadays? I'm using the Q-switch lasers in pigmentation. You know that melanocytes and heat, they don't work good together. They are not good friends with each other. You know that melanocytes, anytime you give them any heat, even during the hot summer days, melanocytes can get stimulated and give you more pigmentation, more problems. So anytime I am suspecting a patient to be pigmenty problem, like melasma, the lentigo, generally pigmentation, PIH, I always prefer to target it with a Q-switch laser than a long pulse laser because it has less heat. Photodisassociation is the mechanism used in ophthalmology. Photochemistry is used in uh, photodynamic therapy. You know that photodynamic therapy started from cancer lesions. They give a photosensitizing medication to the patient, and definitely in the tumor, which I have the accumulation of cells, I have more absorption of this more photosensitizing medication. And then I shoot this area with the light that it's sensitive to with a laser that this tumor is sensitive to the light. 
Photodynamic therapy is starting to come in aesthetics as well. It's still not in practice so much low, but it's starting to be uh, practical in aesthetic as well. Photobiomodulation is the mechanism used in LEDs and when you go to spa and they hold the light, the distance from your skin, five minutes, 10 minutes, blue light, red light, yellow light, Definitely, you have to know that with these um, low-level laser therapies, LEDs are referred, referred as LLLTs, low-level laser therapies. Definitely, I have to know that when I'm holding an LED, I cannot expect under my skin to reach to 70 degrees. How do I expect that LEDs, they do some kind of rejuvenation? Because they do a bit of a rejuvenation. It's not as strong as my class four lasers that they do thermolysis, but of course they do rejuvenation. So how do they do that? You know that our breathing organelles, the ones that define the metabolism of the cells are our mitochondria. We know that with LEDs with low level laser therapies, mitochondrial activity in enzyme production in metabolism increases. So basically, they biomodulate mitochondrial activity and enzyme levels. That's why the rejuvenation you get, it's minor rejuvenation. You see some difference, you see some rejuvenation, you see improvement, but it's not as much as a class or heat treatment. The first time that the theory of selective photothermolysis was discussed was in 1983 by Rox, Anderson, and Parrish. The first time that the first laser was made was 1960 by Theodore Maiman, which was a ruby laser. And maybe it's uh, interesting for you that it was 1960 that the first laser was made, but it took 35 years for FDA to clear this laser as a permanent hair reduction. And uh, for some of you who didn't know this information, IPLs came 30 years later than lasers in the market. The first laser was 1960. The first IPLs, they came in 90s. So how can I make sure, what is the selective photothermolysis as I told you? In theory of selective photothermolysis, I'm talking about destroying my target without destroying the surrounding tissue, not even the epidermis. So how can I do that? By a concept named thermorelaxation time. You know that to any structure, when I give heat, the time it takes for half of this heat or 50% of the heat to be dissipated, this time is called thermorelaxation time. Thermorelaxation time is a time that depends on the size of my structure. It means smaller structures, they heat up faster, they lose the heat faster. It's like when I want to drink a tea and I want to boil this much water, or when I want to cook and I want to boil this much water. Definitely this much water boils faster. And if I don't drink my tea in five minutes, it's cold, but this much water holds the heat for longer time. So smaller structures, they have shorter thermorelaxation time. When you want to do any aesthetic treatment, you have to have the thermal relaxation time of two structures. One important one is epidermis because your aim is never burning the epidermis and your aim is destroying your target, whatever your target is. For example, if you are doing hair removal, you have to know the thermal relaxation time of your hair, uh, epidermis and you have to know the thermal relaxation time of your hair follicle, yes? So in order to have a successful hair removal, I have to save the epidermis. I should never save the hair follicle. I have to kill this, I have to save this. How can I save epidermis? I have to give my laser in a way that my epidermis has time to cool down. It means my pulse duration of the laser will be longer than the thermal relaxation time of the epidermis because my aim is to give a chance for epidermis to cool down. 
But when my aim is not to give the chance to my hair follicle, my pulse duration should be shorter than the thermal relaxation time of my hair follicle. In this way, I can guarantee that I saved epidermis, I didn't save hair follicle. That's why thermal relaxation time is a very, very important concept. So selective phototermalysis, it tells you that you give the laser, your target absorbs the laser, depends on the chromophore. As we discussed, our main chromophores are melanin, oxygenated hemoglobin, and then water. Depending on the chromophore, your chromophore absorbs the laser, gets heated, gets cooked, lysed, without you damaging the surrounding tissue. This is called selective photothermolysis. Energy is delivered as photons, reaches the target by penetrating the skin, minimal absorption by epidermis. How can I make sure that my epidermis doesn't get hot? Guys, I want you to pay attention that there is no hair removal without a cooling. And by cooling, I mean only three methods of efficient cooling. The most efficient, the most effective cooling is called cryogen which is referred as DCD, dynamic cooling device. The second best cooling is contact cooling, which your hand piece has a sapphire inside of it and water circulates around, keeps the surface of your hand piece cold all the time. If your hand piece didn't have a contact cooling or you don't have cryogen placed in your device, then you have to bring a zimmer as a cooling method. Please pay attention that gels and ices are not considered efficient cooling for me. So, minimal absorption by epidermis. Photons are absorbed within the target. My target absorbs the laser more than the rest of the tissue. The target becomes heated. This is the thermal effect. And the heat is to the extent of lysing my target, cooking or killing my target. This is a photo showing you an example of a selective phototermolysis. I just removed the lesion without removing or burning or damaging the surrounding tissue. So, as we said, thermal relaxation time is the concept that I can guarantee I do selective phototermolysis without damaging the surrounding tissue when I know what is the time I have to give to which structure. So, when I'm giving the pulse duration in a short time, I'm basically not letting the heat go away, escape. That's why my short pulse duration works when I want to aim hair follicle or anything of the sort. If I give a pulse duration in long time, I'm basically giving the chance for the structure to cool down. So always my thermal relaxation time is longer than my epidermis, shorter than my target. Whatever is my target. If it's hair follicle, my target is hair follicle. If it's blood vessels, I have to know the thermal relaxation time of blood vessels. Of course, the shorter pulse durations, it's more zappy, more uncomfortable, more painful, and I have to consider that sometimes I can never give a short pulse duration, which is who? Dark skin types. Dark skin types, they, are, they cannot take a short pulse duration. Please remember, pay attention that giving a laser in a short pulse duration is like emptying the bucket of water all at once. And when I have a dark skin, my skin cannot take it. So with a dark skin, I don't need to look at the hair color. I always consider the skin color. But when I have a light skin, then at that scenario, I can check and look at the hair color. When my hair is terminal, thick, dark, black rooted, it means the thermal relaxation time is longer. When I have a light peach fuzz hair, blonde hair in my face means the thermal relaxation time is shorter. So I have to attack it with a shorter pulse duration. Lighter the hair needs shorter pulse duration. 
only in scenario that my skin top type allows me to give a short fall steerage. So these are all important concepts that I want you to be aware of them that when you are giving the heat shorter than the thermal relaxation time, you are uh, keeping the heat inside and your aim is killing. When you are giving the heat longer than the thermal relaxation time, you are basically giving a chance for the structure to cool down. Your aim is saving. So here is the two important structures you have to know. In epidermis, my thermal relaxation time is 3 to 10 milliseconds. In my hair follicle, my thermal relaxation time is 40 to 100. My hair in my face, if it's light, it's approximately 40, 50. The, my hair in my armpit, maybe bikini or my scalp or in men's beard or when I have a dark hair, that hair's thermal relaxation time is 100 or near to 100, depending on the color of the hair. That's why you always ask your patient, what is the color of your hair? As we discussed. If my skin type allows me, like me, I am skin type 3, the range that it's recommended, as you can see in the textbook, the range of thermal relaxation textbook, the range of presents in your device as pulse duration, the pulse duration range that you can do for hair removal is between 10 to 40. 10 is above the skin, all the skin types, 40 is below all the hair. But it doesn't mean that any number between 10 to 40. For those of you who have experience, you will know that post duration of 10 represents a total different results than 12. It's totally different than 15. It's total different scenario than 20. It's totally different than 30. Adjusting the post duration is your responsibility. I want you to know that with adjusting the pulse duration, you can have magical effect and you can have opposite effect of burning a patient like this with a short pulse duration. So pulse duration is an option in your device that puts your hand in so much of freedom. You can play so much with pulse duration, but only if your skin type allows you to do so. So, for example, if I'm skin type 3, it makes a difference if it's my session number 1 or session number 4. In your session number, in my session number 1, if I came to you with terminal hair, if you put a short pulse duration in my session number 1, you burn. Although my skin can take it, for example, if you have the option of putting a pulse duration of 10, 15, 20, 30, and it's my session number one. All of them, my skin can take it. But if you put it at 10 or even 15, in my session number one, you will burn. Why? Because you have so much difference, millisecond difference between the number you have put and the number of my hair. If it's my session number one, my hair is thermal relaxation time. And it's, if it's black, it will be between 80. Now you put it at 10. You have so much difference. You are too zappy or too short. In my session number four, put it at 10. Nothing will happen. Because at my session number four, I, my thermal relaxation time of my hair is not 90 anymore. It reached to 50, 60. You made my hair not condensed, very light, not frequent. So now you can give 10 safely. But if you do give this 10 in previous session, you are very risky. So these are some examples of famous devices in the market. We will just go through, uh, through them together. Excimers are category of lasers that they are called as ultraviolet lasers. Excimers are lasers that they are pure dermatological lasers. They are ultraviolet. We have uh, actually three wavelengths, for example, excimer lasers, 193, 3Z, 3Z, 315 nanometer. 
So at a very short wavelength like excimer, I have to know that my laser doesn't penetrate deep inside my skin. It stays out. That's why excimers are only used for dermatological lesions like psoriasis and vitiligo. That's why they are pure dermatologic lasers. Argon fluoride is the most famous blue laser with 488 nanometer. You know that we say blue is the best color for acne. But you have to know which skin type can I give blue? One, two, three. That's it. We say green is the best color for superficial pigmentation, for epidermal pigmentation. Again, in who can I give a green laser? One, two, three. If I have a darker, uh, deeper pigmentation or darker skin type, I have to use a longer wavelength, like 1064, like MDF. We say yellow is the best color for superficial red vascular lesions. The two famous yellow lasers are pulse dye and copper bromide laser. Again, in who can I give a yellow laser skin type? One, two, three. If I have a deeper vascular lesion or my skin type is not one to three, again, I have to go and use NDF. Hair removal starts from Ruby, 694 nanometers, but you have to know that Ruby is a bit superficial for our hair level. In Eastern countries, in us, usually our hair follicle goes to deep dermis. Ruby is a bit superficial. That's why you don't see much of ruby in this region. Plus, ruby needs a really light skin to do. That's why the first wavelength that we do hair removal is Alexandra. And you know that Alex is considered, I guess, the most popular wavelength in hair removal. Now you know why, because you know that Alexandra has more absorption curve comparing to others. Shorter the wavelength, higher the absorption. The next wavelength for hair removal is diet. In majority of devices, your diet for hair removal is 810 nanometer. In some devices, you will find 800 for hair removal, which we say Alexandra is used for skin type 1, 2, 3, Sometimes for guys, but you have to pay attention. If I use an Alex for skin type 4, I have to adjust my parameters. Adjusting my parameters means what? Reducing your fluence, increasing your pulse duration. You have to be safe on skin type 4. Diet is preferred much more for skin type 4 and some very little of 5, skin type 5. Majority of five and six is advised to be treated with NDA. For skin type six, only, only NDA. And you know that with IPLs, because sometimes we have IPLs in the market for hair removal. IPLs are mainly for skin type one, two, three. Very rarely four, not all the four, very rare. And then we have Erbiomia which is 2940, and then we have CO2, which is 10,600. Again, as a reminder, you remember when I have water absorption, like in the peak of absorption, like Erbium Yag, I have very superficial penetration. Erbium Yag, again, it's very superficial, like blue, it's 50 microns depth penetration. CO2, it is not that much in the peak, but it is still in the absorption curve of water. So CO2, I have 180 microns depth of evaporation. So as you can see in Erbium, I can CO2, the laser went superficial. So I, uh, I want you to tell me if anybody has any questions You can you can get back to the questions and you can type any questions you have. So again, as a review, our laser course is a five days, a full five day course. Uh, for those of you who want to do only hair removals, you can attend the first two days only. It consists of different lectures, and for everything, as I told you, you we have the lecture and we have the actual models to do the hands-on. Everybody gets the chance to practice the hands-on freely. And um, if you attended the first two days, 
you will get a certificate from NCLSC, which is the, one of the most reliable certificates in laser. In your certificate, you will be laser technician, or if you attend the uh, full week, you will be laser therapist. During the five-day course, the full-day course, we will talk about majority of technologies available in aesthetic. We basically talk about everything and we practice everything by with actual models and actual hands-on. So please let me know if anybody has a question. You can text me any question and I'm here to answer you. The thickness, of course, there is the direct relationship with pulse duration to the thickness of the hair. Thicker the hair, longer the pulse duration, as uh, the, uh, longer the thermal relaxation time. We said that thermal relaxation time of the hair is between 40 to 100. 40 is for a hair that it's a light pitch fuzz hair. 100 is when your hair is thick and dark and black. So when you have a thick hair, it means your thermal relaxation time is longer. When I want to target it with pulse duration, I have to consider this longer whole thermal relaxation time. That's why I gave you the example that if your patient is session number one, meaning the hair is thick and dark, don't approach the patient with a short pulse duration. Now your wide pulse duration is enough. So Thickness of the hair is very, very important. You have to know what is the color, how thick is the hair. The thick hair has longer thermal relaxation time, so it needs a longer pulse duration. A thin hair, peach fuzz, blonde, thin hair, has a shorter thermal relaxation time. So in order to catch this hair, you have to target it with a shorter pulse duration. So thermal relaxation time, somebody is asking what is thermal relaxation time? Thermal relaxation time is a time that 50% of the heat to anything is gone. So when I heat hair follicle, when 50% of the heat is dissipated from this follicle, this time that half of the heat is dissipated is called thermal relaxation time. And as I told you, thermal relaxation time uh, is dependent to the size of the structure. Smaller structures, they heat up faster, they lose the heat faster. Bigger structures, they heat up slower, they lose the heat slower. The thermal relaxation time of our epidermis is three to 10. It means in me who is a skin type three, my thermal relaxation time of my epidermis is three milliseconds approximately. In a skin type 6, the thermal relaxation time is 10. Sometimes in some textbooks, you will find 0 to 10 because the skin type 1 can heat up in 0 milliseconds. The hair follicle, when my hair is a light peach fuzz hair, my thermal relaxation time is 40 milliseconds. For a terminal hair in scalp, in bikini, armpits, men's beard, thermal relaxation time is 100. Um, LLLT stands for low level light therapy or LEDs. LEDs are LLLTs, which now you know that they do rejuvenation by photobiomodulation. They stimulate uh, mitochondria to give you more enzymes for metabolism. Monitor cannot be removed by the laser. So, guys, blonde hair, what I want you to know that not only blonde hair, uh, one of the key uh, concepts of a successful hair removal is take a look at the hair at the particular patient. When you need a magnifier or glasses or you need to see the
So if I have a hair that, that it's darker than my skin, then that hair and the darkness, the difference of the color between my hair and my skin is totally visible. I don't need to put projector and magnifier, then this hair will be removed easy. But if I have a blonde hair that doesn't have any color, obviously this hair doesn't have any absorption. If I don't have any absorption, I don't have heat, I don't have killing. Definitely white hair will not get any results. Blonde hair, if it's to the extent that this blonde hair is in a light person that makes the hair color similar to the skin color, no, you will not have effect with laser. But if the blonde hair has a bit of a color, then you can zap it with a short uh, wavelength with a short pulse duration, as you mentioned it yourself. So, um, saggy skin for tightening, we have so many technologies for tightening, which is sagginess. It's not necessarily laser, guys. With laser, the, uh, the treatment for tightening will be mainly resurfacing with a CO2 or radio frequency macroplasma ablation or with erbium yak, I will resurface the skin, especially with CO2, and the result I get is tightening. But we have other technologies that work with sagginess, which mainly is radio frequency. With radio frequency, you go deep down the dermis, you stimulate fibroblasts, and you are asking your fibroblasts to give you new collagen and elastin. And we have very good results with sagginess, with radio frequency, uh, depending different technologies, um, radio frequency comes in micro needling sometimes, but you have very good results with it. Not necessarily laser, but sometimes we have IPLs that they work, they mimic radio frequency. They are called NIRs. NIRs as well, they are used so much for tightening. When do we get paradoxical hair growth? It's a very important question, guys. One of the first and basic uh, measures not to have paradoxical hair growth is to pick your hair properly. That's what I told you. Ladies who don't have dark hair here, don't touch the area when there is no hair. Any area which is not appropriate for hair removal, when you touch it with laser, it's possible to have a paradoxical hair growth. One of the problems happens in aesthetic clinics that they have full body hair removal is that when the patient pays the money for a full body, she thinks, she or he thinks that it's the money is wasted if you don't touch all the parts of the body with laser. You have to sit and explain to the patient that if your hair is not appropriate for laser, it means it's a light color hair, it's a peach fuzz hair, it's a blonde hair. Majority of us ladies, we don't have a hair in our chest in our abdomen, in our back, that is appropriate for hair removal. So if I come and touch it with laser and I give heat to it, especially if I have a slightest hormonal imbalance, I will have paradoxical hair growth. And please be aware of it because paradoxical hair growth will kill you and the patient. If she develops paradoxical hair growth, then it's not a five to six sessions. She might come 10 to 15 sessions. So the first wise thing is not to hit a hair which is not appropriate for paradoxical hair growth. But there are two main paradoxical hair growths that it happens, usually in the face. Face of ladies, again, as my advice, guys, try to avoid as long as, as much as you can, unless this hair in the face is really a hair that is appropriate for hair removal. And remember, face of the ladies is hormonal seat of the lady. So any imbalance, any hormonal problem will manifest its appearance here in the face. The paradoxical hair growth majority of the times comes with two groups, one in young girls that they develop dark hair here. They never had dark hair here. Once they started touching their face with laser, they develop dark hair here. The reason is the heat of a scattering which goes to surrounding tissue is not enough to kill, it's enough to stimulate. So if you had a young girl coming to you to do this part only, during the treatment time, all the time, during the treatment, keep two ice packs here to avoid any heat going to the jawline. This is how to avoid paradoxical hair growth in young girls. 
And a harder paradoxical ha um, hair growth happens in premenopausal and monopausal ladies. When they come after one or two sessions, they will tell you that you turned all my hair here to white, which is true, we turned it to white. Uh, first of all, your advice to the patient is um, never wait until your hair turns to white at that age because then white hair, of course, doesn't respond. And as I told you, since my face is the hormone seat at the age of uh, mon monopause, my body is waiting for any switch to turn to switch to white. At that age, sometimes those of you who don't want to give pain to the patient's 50, 60 year old, or they are sensitive to pain, or for whatever reason, if I am not sure of what pulse duration and what fluence to give, if I don't remove the hair completely, basically what I mean is if I cannot give a 70 degree hair uh, temperature to the hair here, I give 60 instead of 70, what happens is that I partially remove the melanin in this part, and for my body, it recognizes as it's a time for me to turn to white. And it shifts, all the hair shifts to white. And once it's white, only electrolysis is your solution. Then you cannot do anything else. So how to avoid this paradoxical hair growth is when you have a monopausal lady, try to find the highest flu fluence that doesn't burn the patient. Do a patch test. Find your high fluence. Uh, so soft light doesn't help in hair removal, guys. Soft lights, they only lighten the hair. They don't do hair removal. For so many patients, they really don't need to do hair removal, as I told you. So many of us ladies, our hair is already peach fuzz hair. So with soft light or so many times, so many ladies are doing Q-switch laser and bleaching the hair. Bleaching the hair or doing a soft light, uh, but of course, so many experienced after several sessions of soft light, the hair starts getting weaker and falls off after. But this is not a hair removal. You know that a laser hair removal, you will give 70 degree and you kill the hair. Soft light doesn't mean do that. Q-switch laser just shatters, removes the pigment from the hair temporarily, and your hair grows in a longer pace, in a longer time, lighter color. So if you follow IMA, you will know the dates of the five days course. Uh, if you want, I can explain to you. In our day one, we have different lectures about the main lectures, the topics that you will have in your exam. Uh, day two is mainly the hands-on for hair removal. On day three of our laser course, we talk about rejuvenation, skin rejuvenation, pigmentation, vascular lesions. In day four of the laser course, which is a very interesting day, we call it barbecue day, we are doing resurfacings. You see all the three resurfacings. Obviously, for every day, we have lectures in the morning. We have hands-on of what we talked about in the afternoon. Everything we talk about, we will practice. Uh, so we will have the lectures of resurfacings and fractional treatments. In the afternoon, we, we will actually do an erbium yard, CO2 and RF plasma microneedling, RF plasma resurfacing. Uh, and the last day of the laser course is the day of contouring, which we talk about all the technologies available for contouring, for tightening, for reaching to fat. And in the afternoon, of course, we have the hands-on and uh, the participants will have the exam afterwards. You have to uh, attend the online first, you have to finish the online module. Uh, the online module consists of different modules that you will finish it. After fulfilling the online module, you will have an email from NCLC and then you will be eligible to sit for the actual exam. Uh, after finishing the actual exam, which usually is 100 questions, multiple choice, three hours exam, uh, hopefully, if you pass the exam, with, which needs a 70 score to pass the exams, you will be obtained with NCLC certification. Please Google this certification. I'm sure that you all know that it's one of the most reliable certificates. Our uh, place that we are talking about is IMA Dubai. I want you to follow our website of IMA Dubai, and then you will get much more information if you visit our website.
Um, does uh, darker skin, yes, hair removal we can do in darker skin, but we have to pick a longer wavelength, like NDAT. We can do NDAT for dark skin cuts. And nowadays we have different technologies that it's motion technology that we can do for darker skin types. What I want you to remember is that every device is different. I don't want you to get yourself confused with the numbers that you see on devices. In one device, your fluence uh, 10 is a high fluence. In another device, high fluence is a 60. Be sure that in any clinic you are working, you have to get trained with the devices that you are working with and you have to work with the manual of the device. My advice is with every device you see, work with the manual of the going back to the uh, protocols and manuals of the devices. It takes you one or two or three patients to get used to the manuals and numbers of the devices. What I want you to pay attention is the concepts, short pulse duration or long pulse duration, high fluence or short fluence, uh, small spot size or big spot size. This is more important than the numbers that you are talking about. So with the question that somebody asked about the uh, short the pulse duration of 20 and the fluence of 8 or 9 depends on which device you are talking about. In general, when we are talking about Alex, we are talking about skin tone 1 to 3. We are not talking about darker skin types. So, parameters of uh, Q-switch laser for Nivea sub Ota can be different depending on the device. As I told you, in my device, my Q-switch laser can be in one parameter, in another device it will be in another parameter. Go back to the protocol of your device and check what is the recommendation. Guys, be sure that every device has a protocol, something like a booklet, that all the indications that you can do with it, it's written in the booklet. So please go back to it, read your booklets and have access to it. If you don't have it in your clinics, ask the provider to give you the booklets because this is very, very important. And generally, fluence is not only set based on the protocol of the book, fluence is set based on patient sensation. The protocol is telling me do with fluence 25. When I zap the patient with 25, she jumps. She says, I feel like eight. I have to decrease the fluence according to patient sensation. The protocols are just rough guidelines for you, but they are very, very helpful. Any more questions? <laughs> this is a very hard question. No, um, unfortunately, I don't have a personal favorite device among all the devices. You know that every day we are talking about the uh, biggest market, I guess, in the world. Every day you will see new devices, upgraded version, new models. What I want you to know is that uh, you have to know the concept, you have to know the technology. And then you can go back and see what this machine can do to you. In Candela, OK. All the concepts that we are talking about in those of you who are working with Candela is a bit different. Why? Because Candela is a device that uses a fixed pulse duration, which is usually very, very short. That's why it has the most aggressive cooling which is cryogen. In Candela, in the first devices, if you remember, the pulse duration was fixed on three milliseconds. So what happens is that with a three millisecond, if I don't have a cooling, I basically burn everybody's skin. That's why the most 
effective cooling technique is considered to be cryogen. Forget about the fact that cryogen is a very aggressive cooling, guys. Cryogen, by the company that makes it, they say if you hold the cryogen more than 80 millisecond, it guarantees a freeze burn. We have. So it tells you, first thing is you have to be careful with cryogen. Don't hold the cryogen without a laser. We have so many patients that they get pigmentation just because of cryogen. Considering that, and I have a very, very short pulse duration here. So with Candela, my setting is a very aggressive setting. The company tried to compensate this aggressive setting with a cryogen, which in the market you will find so many patients, as I told you. It has initially, from the first session, very good results in terms of hair removal, but very big risks. A dark patient, a skin type 4, so many, they get pigmentation. Uh, the best cooling method, I cannot tell you the best, because the most effective is cryogen, but it's not the best, because it has so much problems with pigmentation later, because it's a very tricky cooling technique. The best nowadays is considered the devices that they have the contact cooling. The sapphire cooling is considered the best cooling, better cooling than cryogen. You're welcome, my dear. So give me more questions, whoever wants. No problem. You're welcome. Um, usually our participants, of course, are doctors, dermatologists, plastic surgeons, GPs, nurses, beauty therapists. Um, look, the matter is that for participating in our laser course, uh, we don't have any limitation. Limitation comes whether you actually can work with this certificate in Dubai, for example, or not. According to DHA, you have to have a medical background, definitely. Beauty therapists, they can. Nurses, they can. Um, so we have sometimes dentists and other professions. Even if you have a, uh, if you are a housewife, you can participate in our course, but then you cannot practice with it according to the rules and regulations. So it depends on the rules and regulations of where you work with. Um, it makes a difference, but usually in order to be able to practice, you have to be in a medical background. Somebody asked which one is better, Q-switch or nano? Q-switches are nanosecond, it's the same, guys. Q-switch lasers, their pulse duration is in nanosecond. If you meant Q-switch or picoseconds, picosecond lasers they are shorter in pulse duration, so they have even less speed comparing to nanosecond. So active medium, somebody asked, what is the active medium of diet laser? It's diet. Guys, the name of lasers are referred to name of the active medium of lasers. So depending on, um, depending on the active medium, depending on the material that I have in the active medium, my laser is different. In CO2 laser, my active medium is a CO2 gas. In Ruby, Alexandrite, Endiac, my active medium is a crystal, is a solid crystal. In uh, pulse dye laser, my active medium is a color that I added to alcohol, is a dye that I added to alcohol, so now my active medium is a liquid. In diode, diode is considered the fourth matter. So we have solid liquid gas, which we talked about. Diodes are considered semiconductor. Semiconductors, you have to consider them like broken glass. Diodes are tunable mediums. It means because there are smaller particles of solids, you can get any wavelength you want from diodes. You means not us, engineers who make the laser. In general, for a laser, medium is none of my business in practice. 
What matters for me is what is the wavelength coming out of this medium. In diode lasers, the medium is diode, which is like a broken glass. It's called semiconductor. So my diode that I work with hair removal gives me 810, but I have diodes that they are 530. I have diodes for liposuction 930. I have diodes for rejuvenation that are 1400 because now you know that diet is a smaller particle. I can get any wavelength from a diet that I want. What matters for you is what is the wavelength that you are getting. Yes, picosecond definitely is faster than nanosecond, so it has less heat comparing to nanosecond. That's why so many they are now in the fan of doing a picosecond, especially for melasma. You're welcome. So any further questions, I will ask you to get back to us in IMA Dubai. It was really a pleasure for me to be with you guys today. And any further assistance, I will be seeing you around. Thank you for joining our webinar today.